How's it going, everybody? Welcome to the Headwater Science Center After School STEM stream. Before we get started, just want to say, if you want to come down to the Science Center, we're open seven days a week. Six days, we are open from 9.30 to 5. And then on Sunday, we are open 1 o'clock to 5 o'clock. And, and this month is October, and near the end of the month, we got a couple things going. One of them being a prehistoric painting night. Uh, if you want to email the Science Center and contact us to sign up for some spots. Uh, we have 20 available where people will be able to come in and you'll learn about and get to paint a 3D printed prehistoric animal. Uh, spots are limited, so please uh, jump on that if you really think it's your, it's your kind of thing. So today, uh, kind of in a mix of, uh, just because I was thinking about Halloween and making costume stuff by hand, and just because it's a topic that I think is overlooked a lot of times in the scientific context, we're going to talk about Neolithic or what a lot of people just refer to as cave art. So cave art is a really broad category. A lot of people think it is just drawings and stuff on cave walls, but it is everything from small carved sculptures, uh, clay art, stencils, uh, customized and personalized tools, clothing, uh, even architecture. Stonehenge is technically Neolithic art. And one thing that people didn't know until recently is tattoos also. Uh, that's a relatively old process, and that is in the range of Neolithic art. So the Neolithic, just for definition, is from 12,000 to 6,500 years ago, uh, what we would call the Stone and Copper Ages. And... At that time, uh, there wasn't a lot of agriculture and sedentary living, so there's not a lot of stuff you can look for for archaeological context for specific locations often, but something people do find quite often are little bits of art, things that might be buried with somebody, or things that were painted on cave walls or left behind or lost. So some of my favorite cave art is uh, drawings of animals. And the subject matter of cave art is something that scientists uh, have cataloged quite extensively. Uh, in fact, most cave art is of animals. Uh, it can be somewhat abstract at times, but one of the common trends is that notably absent are human beings from cave art. The closest we typically get to human beings in cave art are kind of weird animal-human hybrids. There is a very famous uh, carving of a lion-headed person uh, found in a cave, I believe, in Chauvet, France. Uh, that is one of the few representations of a somewhat human figure in the art. And there are some hypotheses about why that is. Some people think humans weren't really in the sort of spiritual or religious significance at the time. Others think that the cave art was a little bit more of a practical thing. Uh, many people do believe, and quite reasonably so, that a lot of cave art is essentially serving the same purpose as a field guide today for wildlife, as these people were hunter-gatherers often, knowing what the animals are, what they look like, and generally how they behave is really important. So being able to communicate that through art means you can basically paint that big mural of all the wildlife up on your cave wall, and you can basically walk someone through it and go, so this animal here, we hunt this way. And you can see like the body shape, it helps familiarize people. The other thing people think it was, was some religious significance. A lot of the first religion was probably animism or spiritualism. And animals are going to be a big focus. Uh, bears are a huge focus of cave art. As we talked about in our cave bear live stream, Neanderthal uh, frequently collected bear parts and would depict bears in art quite often. Another purpose for art would have probably been community activities. At a cave in Chauvet, France, there are quite a lot of hand stencils where people would have put their hands on the wall and using a long, thin, hollow reed, they would have taken very iron-rich, basically kind of watery ink and made a stencil of their hand. And there are hands from people of all ages and gender. It probably was a community bonding activity, just something to say, we're going to mark the cave that we were here. Uh, and kind of a cool thing about that is it tells us a little bit about those people, and we'll get to that in a little bit. The other bit of the art is that it could have just been self-expression. 
everybody does a little bit of art in their life, even, especially when you're young. And it may have just been a way that some people used to relax and unwind at the end of the day. So why is cave art so important? Well, one of the things, it can actually tell us about the individuals who made it. So those hand stencils tell us actually whether people were left or right-handed. And an experiment conducted a couple of years ago where they gave people the equipment to do this uh, showed that almost, I believe, 95% of right-handed people will make the stencil of their left hand using their right hand for the manual and dexterous work of the project. The other thing it can tell us about is what these people thought was important, like we discussed earlier. Humans don't show up in that art that much. Uh, we may not have been all that important in the mind's eye for a person back then, because you know what? Most people probably knew what a person looked like. That wasn't the biggest deal in their life. The other thing is, what does it tell us about the animals and the world they lived in? Uh, cave art of horses in France, a lot of this happens to be in France, very well-preserved caves, show us the pattern coloration of these animals. It showed us that there were a lot of these horses that were spotted. These are things that don't preserve in the fossil or skeletal record. Uh, as we talked about in the saber-toothed cat live stream, cave art and paintings and drawings of saber-toothed cats show us they very likely had large, jowly lips, which covered those big fangs. These are things that we just wouldn't know today. So a lot of times people will write off cave art as just uh, it's just drawings people made a couple thousand years ago, when in reality it can tell us a lot about the people who made it. And the people who made it uh, weren't just homo sapiens like us. We made a lot of it, but we weren't the only ones doing it. As we said earlier, Neanderthals were probably the first artists in Europe. Uh, beat uh, Michelangelo and Raphael to it by a couple thousand years. And they were also some of the first people to wear jewelry that they would carve. Shells were a very frequent thing worn in jewelry. Uh, Chuck, as you told me a couple weeks ago, the first uh, bit of metal, like man-made metal material, was a little jewelry bead. Yeah, it's a, the oldest known uh, smelted piece of metal was a, a jewelry. Yeah, and it, it's something that I think is quite um, wholesome, is that the first thing we do with these new technologies often is to make art or toys. Toys are actually another big part of Neolithic art. Uh, people, kids have always existed in human history, and kids like to have something to play with. Uh, so little carved figurines of animals may not have necessarily been religiously significant, but may in fact have been something that your kids could play with. And oftentimes when you find carvings of animals, we find them after thousands of years sitting, all the stuff that may have been painted on them is worn off, but in reality they may have been painted with bright colors, because again, kids love bright colored toys. The other thing we talked about is personalized tools. Uh, back in that time, people often used flint, obsidian for tools, stuff like this, and oftentimes they would use something like antler carved a little bit more elaborately than just a simple handle as a grip for their tools. People were making stuff that was specific to them, either comfortable or they thought looked good. Uh, another thing we have here is a replica of a copper axe head. Uh, uh, one was found with Otzi the Iceman. Uh, and this copper would have been quite difficult to get a hold of at the time, and the axe handle was carved and shaped to fit very well in his hand, and there was a few little drawings and, and little sketchings and stuff on the handle as well. The other thing about Otzi was that he was tattooed. He had over 61 tattoos on his body. Uh, tattooing is one of, if not possibly, the oldest uh, form of art uh, decorating yourself. Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yep. You're talking about Otzi. Yep, Otzi the Iceman. And tell people about Otzi. So Otzi was a man who lived near the end of the Stone Age, around the time when copper was getting more common. And he was a, a roughly 55-year-old man who, in the Swiss Alps, uh, was shot in the back twice with two arrows and fell down a ravine, and he got frozen and was there for thousands of years. He was found by two hikers who actually thought they had found a far more recently dead person. So the police had to go out there and look and say, uh, no, that is, that is not recent. Uh, but he was a Neolithic man. He lived in central Italy 
uh, what we would call that nowadays. And he was found with quite a lot of stuff. Uh, other things that he was found with were personalized clothing. He had a large grass cloak of long blades of grass to keep him warm. He had a bearskin hat and very nice shoes that were made specifically for him. As we mentioned, clothing, personalized clothing, was a form of art. Uh, a lot of his clothing was made very much to his comfort. And his tattoos actually ran along acupressure points, places where you can press down to relieve a little bit of pain because the man was found with evidence that he had some arthritic issues with his lower back, hip, and shoulder. The other kind of cool thing with Neolithic art, so we mentioned around Otzi's time was when we would see a lot more what we would call megaliths, which are the, that architectural art from the Stone Age where people were taking big stones, carving designs into them, painting probably on them, and putting them in elaborate setups. Stonehenge is probably a way of keeping track of the cycles of the moon and sun, but also it's probably a place of cultural significance where people would gather. So for anthropology, art is pretty inseparable from telling us how humans developed culturally and as a species because art is a way that we exercise our imagination and kind of helps us think in different ways sometimes uh anything you want you want to talk about chuck specifically on this um could you tell people how people started telling the viewers how people started uh producing copper so copper is something that it is one of the few metals that you can find that is an element. So it's, you don't have to mix two things. You don't have to make an alloy. And there are rocks nat and minerals naturally occurring that will have trace elements of copper in them. So Otzi's ice, well, Otzi the Iceman's axe was actually smaller than this, uh, but probably took a, about 300 pounds of raw malachite crushed and processed to get the copper for a about 3.7 inch axe head. So he either was not the one who started that project, or he traded for the copper, or traded for the axe head itself. But making raw materials was something that could take time, and oftentimes that was probably one of the leading factors in trade routes. You know, some people lived closer to these resources than others. Sometimes you'd have to travel over 100 miles to get to a nice, nice deposit of obsidian, and sometimes it's easier to trade with somebody who was there more recently and has some spare obsidian laying around. You could trade them a nice set of antlers or food or a nice little animal carving, a toy for their kids for that raw obsidian. Another thing, actually I did forget to go over, uh, with the cave art, some animals are more common than other. This made me randomly think of that. Horses are, and cows are probably some of the most common animals and with cows i am including bison but aurochs as well the ancestor to modern domestic cows are in it mammoth are in it we actually have i believe about 85 mammoth drawings in caves around europe and eurasia bears are a pretty common one the red bear cave in france has a beautiful uh, amount of bear drawings deer show up in almost every cave art uh sort of collection that you will find all the way into North America. Lions are common. And recently we found a cave that had approximately, I believe, 75 drawings of rhinos from the time, which would have been the woolly rhinos of the Ice Age. And those ones actually show us some of the coloration of that animal as well. We didn't know really what color their fur would be. And we actually know now they had a very light, kind of like this bear pelt here, colored brown fur with a little bit darker Kind of a belt of darker fur around the, the midsection but yeah no so like art and stuff has always been a big part of human life and people have it's kind of fun thing of learning when that started and where that started and how we started making art and it's something that obviously to this day we still do quite a lot of art uh the uh what is that called the uh uh what's the big swinging thing chuck the what? what's the uh, thing over there we do the uh the drawings the here. The harmonograph. The harmonograph is a bit of art. Um, we have quite a few little art displays here that are scientific in nature. Um, it's a huge part of how we learn, how we teach, and how we interact with each other. Uh, music is something I didn't touch on that much in this because we don't have a whole lot of evidence of how people were doing that, but it does stand to reason that people were 
uh, were doing music back then, singing and stuff. Uh, another thing we were talking about beforehand is storytelling uh, could be considered a form of art. And people were definitely telling stories. And the cave paintings of animals and hunts may have been great uh, little tools for helping you tell the story. We still do it. It's called movies and television. Exactly. Uh, this stuff didn't just go away. It just changes a little bit with the times. Um, could you tell people about the, uh, the Clovis Point? Yeah, so the, the Clovis Point is one that we actually have quite a lot. This is very unique for North American flint napping. The first Clovis Points were found in New Mexico. And the difference between a Clovis Point and most flint arrowheads at the time is this base. So what this is called is being fluted. It's that little kind of chipped out indent and it actually gets a little bit narrower in here as well it's a little bit hard to see and this is a 3d printed replica there you go whereas with this it's just kind of a solid thing this would jam in um and a lot of times people would put rather elaborate handles on their flint knives and the clovis points are often found with very nice antler or wood handles and oftentimes it's wood that wouldn't be found locally. And Clovis points are kind of a unique thing. They first show up in New Mexico and within uh, areas, within like a couple hundred years, a lot of people on North America were making Clovis points. It is evidence for trade and not just trade of physical points, but the trade of ideas. Someone basically who was using these arrowheads saw someone using the Clovis arrowhead and like, Oh, wait, that that works a lot better for putting it on, like, a handle or something. So they started doing the same thing. And it's a great show that we always learn from each other, and art and tools are always a part of that. Um, you have any other kind of fun? Well, some people don't realize that the Anishinaabe people along uh, uh, the shore of Lake Superior actually uh, used copper. They used native copper. They would go to... Uh, well, some people uh, in the uh, Upper Peninsula of Michigan, near what's now called Copper Harbor, um, found native copper that exists that pure copper element uh, just out on the surface of the of the, of the land. And uh, native people from the North Shore would uh, canoe to Isle Royal, where there are surface copper deposits there, oh. and gather it at certain times of year, and then bring it back and. and and they didn't smelt it, they didn't melt it, but they did uh, form it into knife blades and other utensils and things that uh, were actually very similar to the things we have today. Yeah, uh, North and South America have actually, a lot of people tend to think metal just doesn't show up in like tools and art, but it showed up a lot. Uh, South and Central America too had a lot of gold and platinum. And uh, if you ever hit the Chicago Field Museum, they have a large collection of platinum and gold art little things made by the people there. But yeah, no, it's something I've always been interested in, the art that people made, and the stuff that people often wouldn't consider it art, but at the time it probably was somewhat. And it's something that, you know, art's a very broad thing, but it tells us a lot about the people who made it, and it's always fun. So let's see if we can get the camera in on some of these little, little animals. So these are made in the style of a lot of Neolithic carvings that you'll find. Animals are very frequently found in these little, little things around the world. And this is actually a 3D scan of a carving someone made of a woolly rhino a few thousand years ago. And they carved it out of bone, and you can see that texture in the scan there. And they are a very common animal in carvings. These, carv these are actually modeled after the Red Bear Cave silhouettes. A lot of cave art is slightly exaggerated. Uh, sometimes they exaggerate features of the animals that are rather important to know. Like, they'll exaggerate the tusks on mammoths or the horns on rhinos because, well, if you're hunting one, you do kind of want to look out for it, and they'll exaggerate the front end on a bear because that's the end you don't want to be around. And then bison get that big exaggerated, you know, hump on the shoulder and the big head because, again, you don't want to go near the front end of it if you're hunting it. Yeah. Yeah. Overall, we might we might have to do a live stream just on uh, resources and how people have used like local stuff like that copper more. But yeah, but yeah. So thank you for tuning in today, everybody. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you here at some point during the week.